أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والحمد لله الذي جل على وجوب وجوده يفتقار الممكنات وعلى قدرته وعلمه أحكام المصنوعات المتعاليا مشابهة الجسمانيات المنزه بجلال قدسه عن مناسبة الناقصات نحمده همدا يملو أقطار الأرض والسماوات ونشكره شكرا على نعمه المتظاهرات المتواترات والصلاة والسلام على إمام القبلتين ونبي الحرمين وأفضل الثقلين وجد الحسن والحسين الذي سمي في السماء بأحمد وفي الأرض بأب القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيت الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين الصادقين والذين ذهب الله عنهم الردس وطهرهم تطهيرا اللهم صل وسلم وزد وبارك على صاحب دعوة النبوية والسولة الحيدرية والإسمة الفاطمية والحلم الحسني والشجاعة الحسينية والإبادة السجادية والمآثر الباخرية والآثار الجعفرية والعلوم الكاذمية والحجج الردبية والجود التكفية والنكابة النكبية والحيبة الأسكرية والغيبة الإلهية اللهم عجل فرجه وصاهل مخرجه أما بعد فقد قال الله في كتابه الكريم بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل هو الله أحد الله السمد لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا أحد صل على محمد وعلى For the love of Ahlul Bayt alayhim as salam, sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. For the love of Fatima al Zahra, salamu alayhi alayha, a second salawat ala Muhammad wa ali. For the hastening of the reappearance of the master of our time, a louder salawat ala Muhammad. The verses which I just recited at the beginning of this majlis are verses which are known to each and every single one of you. They are verses which belong to a chapter which in terms of length it's considered amongst the shortest of the Quranic chapters. But in terms of the depth of its content, it has been made equivalent to one third of the Quran. It's a chapter that the moment a child has the capability and the capacity, you teach him to recite this chapter, you teach him to memorize this chapter. And it's a chapter which is known through many names. The most famous amongst which are Surat Al-Tawheed or Surat Al-Ikhlas or more simply Qul Wallahu Ahad based upon the first verse of the chapter. And it's a chapter whose recitation has many fawaid and benefits. It's a chapter which explicates and explains the nature of the divine reality of Allah. And it is a chapter which embodies the virtues of Al-Insan Al-Kamil, the perfect man, and the fadail of Ali ibn Abi Talib. For the famous tradition, for the famous tradition of the Prophet, which has been narrated in Shi'i and non-Shi'i sources, it states, Ya Ali, ma mataluka fin nas illa ka matali qul huwallahu ahad fil Qur'an. 
that, O oh, Ali, what is your example amongst the people except for the example of Surah Quluhu Wallahu Ahad Watan Quran? Man Qara'aha Marratan Faka'annama Qara'a Tulat Al Quran. The one who recites it once, it's as if he has recited one third of the Quran. Waman Qara'aha Marratain Faka'annama Qara'a Tulatay Al Quran. The one who recites it twice has recited two thirds of the Quran. Then he says, Waman Qara'aha Talat Marrat Faka'annama Qara'a qara Al Quran Kulla. That the one who recites this chapter three times, it's as if he has recited the entire Quran. Then after that, the Prophet, he says, Wakada anta ya Ali. That, O oh Ali, your example is like this. The one who loves you biqalbihi with his heart has completed one third of his iman. The one who loves you with his heart and it manifests bilisanihi upon his tongue has completed two thirds of his iman. The one who loves you with his heart and manifests upon the tongue and it is seen within the limbs and the actions as, as if he has completed his entire iman. You know, based on this tradition, based upon this tradition, I've come to the subject matter of the night, which is an examination of the commentary of Surah at tawheed and its relationship with Ali ibn Abi Talib. Now the relevance of this topic is numerous and it is folded a number of times. The first reason for the importance of this topic is that it allows us to examine the realm of the virtues of Amir al muminin within the Quran. That when you look at somebody like Suyuti who is not a Shia and you look at somebody like Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, these individuals, they state that there are 300 verses of the Quran revealed within the praise of Ali ibn Abi Talib. You find our scholars have gone towards a higher number. That when you look at this Quran, the more it looks like the Qasida of Amir al muminin That when Ali does something as simple as he has four dirhams, he gives one away at night, one in the daytime, one in the evening, one openly, one secretly. You find Allah, he reveals an ayat, الَّذِينَ يُنْفِقُونَ أَمْوَالُهُمْ بِاللَّيْلِ وَالنَّهَارِ سِرًّا وَعَلَانِيًا That those who give away their wealth in the day, in the night, openly and secretly, Allah, he reveals an ayat. When Ali gives away his ring in ruku, Allah, he says, إِنَّمَا وَلِيُّكُمُ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا الَّذِينَ يُؤْقِمُونَ السَّلَاةِ وَيُؤْتُونَ الزَّكَاةِ وَهُمْ رَاكِعُونَ he says that your wali is Allah and his prophet and the one who establishes prayer and gives away zakat while in ruku, Allah, he reveals an ayat. So you find that this subject, it allows us to understand this subject matter. But from the second level, you find the relevance of this topic lies in this, is that many of us, we've been reciting this chapter for 40, 50, 60 years of our lives. If we were to ask ourselves the question that what really do we understand from this chapter? Is it as simple as that God is one, he has no children, he has no partner, and that is enough? Or is there a deeper reality towards this chapter? Now, if I ask you this question, that within the last 10 years of your life, has your understanding of this chapter been the same or has it increased? That a person who is progressing a person who is on this intellectual journey in life, you find based upon his experiences, his understanding of the Quran should increase year by year. Or is the reality as the Quran says, Afala yatadabbarun al Quran am ala kulubihim akfaluha? That do they not ponder over the Quran or is there a lock upon their hearts? You know, people they ask the question is that within this time period of occultation, when the hadith, it says, Man mata walam ya'rif imama zamanihi mata mitatan jahiliya. That when the hadith, it says that the one who dies without knowing the imam of his time has died the death of someone in ignorance, how does one truly know the imam of his time in this period of occultation? You find one of the ways to do so is to understand the Qur'an. For understanding the Qur'an is to understand the Imam and the Ahlul Bayt and to understand the Ahlul Bayt is to understand the Book of Allah. And this is why the journey of Sayyid al-Shuhada in many ways, 
was a journey of implementing the Quranic vision. That's why time and time again, the Imam, he would refer to the verses of the Quran. For example, when the Imam, he leaves Medina upon the 28th of Rajab, he recites the verse number 21 from chapter 28, Surah Al-Qasas. He says, فَخَرَجَ مِنْهَا خَائِفًا يَتَرَقَّبُ قَالَ رَبِّ نَجْنِي مِنَ الْقَوْمِ الظَّالِمِينَ he, and he says that he left in a state of fear and vigilance, and he said, oh my Lord, save me from the oppressive people. You find Sayyid al-Shuhada time and time again, he would refer towards the Quran, and the reality is there, even when they would carry the head of Sayyid al-Shuhada. You find that history, it records, that a point it came where the blessed head of the Imam began to recite the Quran. That it said, Am hasibta anna ashab al kahfi wa raqimi kanu min ayati na ajaba. That do you suppose the people of the cave and the inscription are from our astonishing signs? So you find all of these realities they go to show. That these days of Muharram in many ways are the days of the Quran, and they are the days of the Quranic vision. And this is why upon this night we'll analyze this topic. Now, when you look at this chapter, Surah al tawheed you find an individual like Fakhruddin al-Razi, who is not a Shi'i, but a Razi within his tafsir, he says, that this chapter, Quluhu Wallahu Ahad, it has 20 titles. From amongst the titles of this chapter is Al-Ma'rifa. And you find each of these titles will relate towards Ali ibn Abi Talib, that when one wants to properly understand Allah, then he does so through the teachings of Surah at tawheed No, another title towards this chapter is An-Najah. That when one wants to deliver himself towards that path, you find Surah at tawheed Another title towards this chapter is Nur al-Quran. For the Prophet as a hadith, that every single thing has a light and the light of the Quran is Surah at tawheed you know, no, another chapter which is based upon the hadith of Rasulullah is that this chapter alongside Surah Al-Kafirun is al muqashki Shaitan. That what is al muqashki Shaitan? al muqashki Shaitan, it means it is the cure. That this chapter alongside Surah Al-Kafirun, you find it is a cure for the hearts of the individuals. That when you look at Surah Al-Kafirun and Surah Al-Tawheed together, you find they give a complete reality. That Surah Al-Kafirun gives the reality of bara'a and tabarra. That you disassociate from those false lords, from those who go against the way of Allah. But you find that Surah at tawheed shows the reality of Wilayatullah. That's why these two elements together, they are the cure of the hearts of the human beings. You know, oftentimes we see in our A'mal that when you look at Ziyarat al-Ashura, you find that section with the 100 la'an, it precedes the section with 100 salawat. You know, you ask yourself that why do the la'an precede the salawat? You know, they ask the same question towards Ayatollah Bahjat. Ayatollah Bahjat replied by saying that when you have a gathering within your house, the first thing you do is you sweep the house, you clean the house, and then you decorate the house. He says, understand this reality. When in Ziyarat al-Ashura, you disassociate from the killers of Sayyid al-Shuhada, you clean your heart and then you decorate it with salawat upon Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. You find these chapters, Surah Al-Kafirun and Surah Al-Tawheed, they serve this reality together. But you find no, another famous name of this chapter is Surah Al-Ikhlas. The moment you understand this word Ikhlas, you'll understand the nature of this chapter and you'll understand its connection with Ali ibn Abi Talib. You find within the Arabic language, the word ikhlas has numerous nuances and numerous senses. From one sense, you find the word ikhlas, it dignifies and it denotes purity. From another sense, you find it means to free someone. That's why in Arabic, when you talk about freeing a slave, you use the word khalasa, from which ikhlas is also found. 
but you find that it also carries the sense of sincerity. That when we come to the first connection between Ali ibn Abi Talib and Surah at tawheed you find the first connection is this is that this chapter, it embodies the teachings of insincerity. If you want to see a creation, which is the mujassima, which is the embodiment of sincerity, then you look at the wujud of Ali ibn Abi Talib, that when you want to understand ikhlas, you go towards the doorsteps of Amir al muminin That's why in Nahjul al-Balagha, in Khutbat al-Ula, what does the Imam say? He says, أَوَّلُ الدِّينَ مَعْرِفَتُهُ وَكَمَالُ مَعْرِفَتِهِ أَتَّصْدِيكُ بِهِ وَكَمَالُ التَّصْدِيكِ بِهِ تَوْهِيدُهُ وَكَمَالُ تَوْهِيدِهِ الْإِخْلَاسُ لَهُ وَكَمَالُ الْإِخْلَاسِ لَهُ نَفْيُ الصِّفَاتِ أَنْهُ The Imam, he says, that the first thing within the religion is his ma'rifah. The perfection of his ma'rifah is in his tasdeeq and confirmation. The perfection of his confirmation is in his tawheed and unity. The perfection of his unity is in his ikhlas and sincerity. And the perfection of ikhlas is to make sure that there are no attributes which are ascribed towards him. You know, I'll explain each of these five stages. The Imam, he gives five marahil and stages. The first is what? Ma'rifah. The second is tasdeeq. The third is tawheed. The fourth is ikhlas. Surah al-ikhlas. And the fifth is nafyus tashbih. You find the first reality when the imam, he says, awwalu deen ma'rifatuhu. The imam goes to show that the foundation of this religion, everything it is founded upon is that perfection of that ma'rifah and that recognition of Allah. And the perfection of that recognition is his confirmation. You know, now the question it comes up is that what is the difference between ma'rifa and tasdeeq? What is the difference between recognition and confirmation? You find many of the ulama, when they wrote the commentary of Nahjul Balagha, they would write this line. They would say ma'rifa is a type of ilmul ijmali, that it is a type of summarized knowledge that every single human being deep down within his fitra and his nature, you find the reality of the existence of the divine is within the nature of a human being. That's why a man, he goes towards Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi. He says to the Imam, dallani ala Allah ma huwa. That, oh Imam, guide me towards Allah. What is Allah? The Imam says to him that, have you ever been in an ocean? He says, yes, I've been in an ocean. And he says, has your boat ever capsized within the ocean? He says, yes, it's capsized. He says, at that point, was there anyone to help you? He says, no one was there to help me. He says, but in that moment, didn't you have hope that someone would save you? He says, absolutely, I did. The Imam, he says, that hope in that higher reality within your heart, that hope is Allah. You find everyone within their heart. At one level, you find they have a generalized knowledge of Allah. But through various means, whether it is irfan or burhan, whether it is intellectual arguments, whether it is a spiritual connection, you find he is able to confirm the reality of Allah and he reaches the stage of tasdeeq. You know, I don't know if you know the poet Josh Mali Abadi who would recite poetry in Urdu. He would write many martia. You know, this individual within his life, he was a Muslim. He becomes an atheist. He becomes a Shia. They say to him, oh man, you are a Muslim. Then you become an atheist. Then you become a Muslim again. And out of all of the sects, you become a Shia. That what is this life journey of yours? He replied to that man by saying that when I came back towards the path of Allah, I didn't do it through intellectual argument. I didn't go and travel the world. All I saw was that there was a Hussein on the day of Ashura. And that Hussein was willing to sacrifice everything for his creator. I thought to myself that if this man is willing to sacrifice everything for his creator, then there must be a creator for whom he is sacrificing. This is that reality. You find the heart at a certain point. 
it confirms the realities. And when it confirms the reality of Allah, you find it reaches the stage of Tawheed. But higher than the stage of Tawheed is the stage of sincerity and ikhlas. You know, what is this ikhlas? You know, say Ibn Mitam al-Bahrani, he wrote a famous shar on Najul Balagha. When he wrote about the word ikhlas, he used this line, and I'll connect this line towards the life of Amir al-Mu'mineen in this analysis. He would say, when you want to understand ikhlas, ikhlas is tasfiyatu shay'an al-ghayr. It is to clean your heart of everything except for that reality you are trying to connect with. You find if you want to see the practical embodiment of this, look at Amir al muminin That, you know, upon the day of Khandaq, upon that day, you find an army had gathered against the Prophet, the likes of which Islamic history hasn't seen. At that point, when all of the tribes had gathered, you find Salman, he goes towards Rasulullah. He says, oh Rasulullah, when I was in Fars, when I was in Iran, one of our battle tactics would be is that we would dig a trench, we would dig a khandaq. That, oh Rasul Allah, I suggest that you dig a khandaq and a trench around the city of Medina. You find at that point, Jibra'il descends upon the Prophet and Jibra'il says, oh Rasul Allah, Allah is pleased with the advice of Salman. You know, if you want to understand the status of the one who is minna ahlul bayt the one who was from the household of Ahlul Bayt. You look at this reality that Allah was pleased with the advice of Salman. But you find despite that, a point it came when that man, Amr ibn Abdul Wid al-Amiri, he jumps the trench and he speaks towards the Muslims. And he says to them, it's very simple, and I'm using my own words. He says, if you kill me, you get paradise. And if I kill you, then you're martyred, you get paradise. Is there anyone amongst you who will fight me? Amir al muminin stands up, Rasulullah says, Ali, sit down. You find a second time, he asks, is there anyone to fight? When the Prophet asks, a man, he stands up. Rasulullah says, oh man, are you going to fight? He says, I'm not going to fight. But I just wanted to say that I saw this Amr ibn Abdul Wid. There was an entire gang, an entire tribe trying to steal from him. He would use their small camel as a shield and he would fight all of them. Rasulullah says, are you trying to stare, scare me? Sit down. But it's only on the third occasion when Amir al muminin he stands up. Rasulullah says, oh Ali, come with me. When Amir al muminin goes with the Prophet, inside of the tent history it records, Rasulullah, he exchanges his aba with Ali ibn Abi Talib, his cloak. But when he comes out, he exchanges his amama and his turban with Amir al muminin You know, I used to think to myself, O oh Rasulullah, that why didn't you exchange the amama at the same time as you exchange the cloak? But you find the Prophet has wisdom within every movement. You find the reason Rasulullah publicly would exchange that turban is that he knew after his death the dispute will be over who wears the amama and the turban of Rasulullah. Upon that day, he made it clear that there is none except Ali ibn Abi Talib. Now, when Amir al Mu'mineen, he goes towards Amr bin Abdul Wid. He says towards him, O oh, Amr, I hear that you accept one out of three requests. Amr says, this is the case. The Imam says, my first request is that you accept Islam. He says, if I was going to accept Islam, I wouldn't have come all this way to fight you. Then the Imam, he says, then turn around and don't fight. You see, the Imam would only fight when it was the final option to fight. The Imam, he says, turn around. Amr, he says, if I turn around now, all of the women of the Arabs will laugh at me. You find then the Imam, he says, come and fight me upon the ground. You know, it was the system of the Arabs. When they would fight on the ground, it would be either I would survive or you would survive. It won't be the both of us. History records, if you want to see the peak of ikhlas and sincerity, a point it comes that as the companions are watching Amir al muminin the Imam as he's fighting Amr, 
he steps back and then he goes towards them. They say, Ya Ali, why did you do this? The Imam, he says, a point had come where Amr, he had spit upon my face and he cursed my mother. If I struck him at that point, it would have been out of my personal anger, not the pleasure of Allah. You find from this one incident, an entire tradition in Islamic history called Futuwa or spiritual chivalry had began. In Urdu and Farsi, you call it Jawan Mardi. That what is Jawan Mardi? What is Futuwa? You know, within the Islamic concept, the word Fata has a very deep context. That when you hear the lines, La Fata illa Ali, and you translate it as there is no youth except for Ali. Is it as simple as it, this is the translation or is there a deeper context? You find this word fata. It symbolizes a hero in the contextual sense that it has in Latin. You know, today the word hero is used in films and movies. But within the original sense in Latin, you find the word hero was associated with virtue. And virtue within Aristotelian logic, it was that individual who was willing to do the right thing in every single situation. That's why the fata in Islamic history was an individual of sincerity and particular qualities. And if you want to understand the reality of ikhlas, Ali ibn Abi Talib would say, akhlis lillahi. The Imam would say, make your knowledge and your actions sincere for Allah. And make your love and your hate sincere for Allah. You know, they asked the fifth Imam, is that is there any connection between love and religion? The Imam says, alaysa deen illa al-hub. That is love anything except religion? You know, they said to Musa, it's stated within the books of Hadith, that Musa, he has a conversation with Allah. He says, oh Allah, I want to do something for you. So I have prayed. Allah says, oh Musa, you did that for yourself. Musa, he says, oh Allah, I fasted. Allah says, Musa, you did that for yourself. Musa says, I gave away charity. Allah says, oh Musa, you did that for yourself. At that point, Musa, he says that, Oh Allah, is there anything I can do for you? Allah says, Oh Musa, love for my sake and hate for my sake. That the Imam says, make your love and your hate sincerely for Allah. That when you have love for your family or those who are around you, it is because Silatul Rahim is something which Allah has made mandatory upon you. That everything you look, when you look at the mu'mineen, you find within their hearts they have the love of Ahlul Bayt. For the sake of that love, you don't divide your communities. You find all of these realities are there. Then the Imam, he says, he says, Hakikatul Dhikr. He says the final endpoint of this reality and this remembrance is that when you remember your beloved, you don't remember yourself in that remembrance. That when you have a majlis for Ahlul Bayt, you find that spiritual end goal is to lose yourself in the remembrance of Ahlul Bayt to such a point that not even your ego comes into the majlis of Hussein. You know, many people, they say this line, that if I was not within this city, then this majlis wouldn't happen, this Imam Bargha wouldn't be there, this masjid wouldn't be there. But you find the reality is the opposite. If the majlis of Hussein wasn't there, if the house of Hussein wasn't there, then you wouldn't be there. You find this is that reality. You know, I've spent 20, 25 minutes, all we've discussed is the word ikhlas. That you find this is how deep Quranic commentaries can be, and the reality is if we examine them the rest of our lives, we cannot give the haq towards the Quran. But you find the question comes up, is that what is the fawaid and the benefits of reciting this chapter? You find there's a famous tafsir called Tafsir Nur at taqalain You find these different tafsir, they have different methodology. When Allama Tabatabai would do tafsir in Al Mizan, his tafsir of the Quran would be by the verses of the Quran. But you find this tafsir, Nur at taqalain it is something which is called Tafsirun Rivayun, that it is a commentary which is based upon the narrations of Ali Muhammad. You know, within this commentary, there are 90 hadith which are mentioned in the fawaid and the benefits of Surah At-Tawheed. You find one of those hadith, they state 
that when you enter a house, recite Surah At-Tawheed, for this will have two impacts upon the resident of the house. The first impact is that it will increase sustenance and risk within that house. The second impact is that it will remove faqar and poverty from that house. You know, another hadith, the Prophet, he says, which one amongst you cannot recite one third of the Quran in one night? They say, Ya Rasulullah. Who can recite one third of the Quran? The Prophet says, recite Surah at tawheed But you know, the question that comes up, why is Surah at tawheed one third of the Quran? You find one group of mufassireen, they said, that when you look at the totality of the Qur'an, you find it is divided into three portions. The first is ahkam and rulings. The second is tarikh and history. The third is aqaid and belief. You find Surah at tawheed it covers belief and aqaid. But no, another group it said that one third of the message of the Quran is the message of Tawheed. You find this chapter, it contains the reality of Tawheed in it. Why was this chapter revealed? You know, a tradition of the sixth Imam says a Jewish individual by the name of Abdullah bin Surya or Abdullah bin Salam, the traditions they differ. He goes towards Imam as Sadiq. He says, O Ja'far as Sadiq. When he goes towards Rasulullah, the Imam, he says, he says towards the Prophet, O Prophet, what is the genealogy and the hasab and the lineage of your Lord? At that point, after three days, the verses were revealed, Qul huwallahu ahad. Allahu samad lam yalid wa lam yulad wa lam yakullahu kufuwan ahad. It says, say that he is ahad. And I didn't translate Ahad on purpose. That he is self-sufficient. Neither does he beget, nor does he bega is he begotten, and there is none like him. You find the second connection between Surah At-Tawheed and Ali ibn Abi Talib. It lies in the fact that when you want to see the embodiment of Tawheed, in the way that you look at Surah Al-Ikhlas, you look at the life of Amir al muminin That this is that Imam who would say that, Oh Allah, there was nothing except which, before which, and during which, and after which, Oh Allah, I would see you. This is that Imam who would say that I sat at the gate of my heart and I let nothing except Allah into this heart. This is that Imam who would say, Ma that, oh Allah, I did not worship you out of the desire of heaven, nor out of the fear of hell, but I found you worthy of being worshipped, so I worshipped you, oh Allah. That this is that reality of Amir al muminin Now we come towards the verses of this chapter. You know, the first verse in this chapter is not Qul Huwallahu Ahad. The first verse in this chapter is Bismillah rahman rahim now you find five majalis can be recited on Bismillah. That what is the reality of this verse? You know, it's stated that there was one alim, a man comes towards him. He says towards him, Sayyid, can you write a ta'weez? He says, absolutely, I'll write it. After he writes it, he says that don't open it. When you go across the river, you'll be able to walk upon that water. You find he goes towards it, he walks on the water, the man, he begins to think that what did this man write? That it gave me such ability that I walked across the water. He says, I wanted to open it, so I opened it. When I opened it, within it was written, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I thought to myself, that's it, only Bismillah is written over here? You find after that, he takes that letter, he takes that writing, he goes to the water, he falls within the water. Now when he goes back towards that alim, he says towards him that why did you tell me not to look at the paper? Is it that it stops to work when you look at it? He says, no, it doesn't stop to work. But the reality is, is that you don't have yaqeen and certainty within the verse. You know, what is the reality of Bismillah? You know, when you look at this verse, you say Bismillah. You say, I ask in the name of Allah. You know this ba within Bismillah, 
The ba in Arabic has nine meanings. Out of nine, the mufassireen, they write that two are appropriate. Either ibtida or isti'ana. Either you're saying, I begin in the name of Allah, or you're saying, I seek help through the name of Allah. You know, there's an entire school of thought, they say, that can you ask through other than Allah? Now, over here, you're not saying, Billahi. You're saying, Bismillahi. Now, the reality is, is that the name is different from the named. Now, it's a bit of a philosophical discussion. But you find within the books, there's an entire discussion about the ism and the musamma. You know, some people, they say that when you think of a halwa or you think of something sweet, you find something that your mouth, it begins to salivate. This goes to show that the name and the named are the same. No, I reply by saying that if you think of something sweet, the sweet should come into your mouth for it to be the same. That if fire and the wujud of fire was the same, the moment you think of the word, fire should come and it should burn you. But you find the reality is this, is that the name is different from the named. That my name is Sayyid Bilal Rizvi. If tomorrow you change my name, I'll still be the same individual. When you find that you say Bismillah, you find that you are asking through other than Allah. And you find that our sixth Imam would say, Nahnu Asma Allah Al Husna, that us Ahlul Bayt are those names of Allah. That in the sense that if you want to see the manifestation of the Asma of Allah, you look at Ahlul Bayt. Now, of course, those asma are part of the essence of Allah. But Ahlul Bayt, they have that reality through complete dependency upon Allah. You find this is that reality of Bismillah. Then after that, you say, Qul Wallahu Ahad. That you don't say, say he, you don't say he is one. You say, say he is one. If I told you to say that he is one, you would say he is one. You wouldn't say, say he is one. You find that this qul within the Qur'an is one of the pieces of the evidence of the truthfulness of the Qur'an and of the Prophet. And I say this with full responsibility. There is no other work besides the Qur'an amongst the books of religion that have this word qul and this word say within that. You know, the Prophet was so honest. That when Allah said, O oh Muhammad, say, Rasul Allah would even use the word qul. And you find this word qul would always, would all many times serve as a barrier between the Prophet and those who did not believe. You find he would say, Qul ya ayyuhal kafirun, qul ya ahl al kitab. You find this is that reality. After that, you say, Huwallahu ahad. You see, you start the sentence with the word huwa. This word huwa is a damir, it is a pronoun, it is ghaib, it is not there. When I say he, the person you may know who I'm speaking about, you may not know who I'm speaking about. When this sentence, it starts with the word he, you find it indicates towards the hidden essence of Allah. That's why many of the urafa, they said the word huwa is even more powerful than the word Allah. Because the word Allah, is that locus where all of the attributes of Allah, they gather upon one name. All of the asma of Jamal and beauty, all of the asma of Jalal and grandeur. You know, Allah has different names. That you find Ar-Rahman is a name of the majesty and the beauty of Allah. You find that Allah has different names. Al-Quwa, that he is the one with strength. You know, I remember they asked one alim, that they said to him that who was more beloved towards Sayyid the shahada Abbas or Ali Akbar? That how would you reply towards that question? He said that Akbar was more muhib, whereas Abbas was more aziz. And he says in the way that Allah has Jalal and Jamal, you find that Abbas would represent the Jalal of Sayyid the shahada Akbar would represent the Jamal of Sayyid the shahada so you find different realities they gather upon the word Allah. But the word huwa is that word 
that indicates the hidden essence of Allah. When this verse, it starts with the word huwa, it goes to show that the imagination and the intellect, it cannot reach the essence of Allah. It will always remain hidden. That's why Allah, He would say in one hadith al-Qudsi, He would say, Kuntu kanzan makhfiya, fa'ahbabtu an a'raf fa'khalaqtu al-khalq. Allah, He says, I was a hidden treasure and I love to be known. So I created all of creation, why? So they can know me. That this is that reality. You know, it's stated upon the day of Badr. As Ali ibn Abi Talib was fighting upon the day of Badr, Amir al muminin would be reciting a dhikr. When they went closer towards the Imam, they asked the Imam, Oh Imam, what dhikr are you reciting? The Imam, he would say, Ya huwa, Ya man la huwa, illa huwa. The Imam would say, Oh he, Oh he whom there is none except for he. They said, Ya Ali, where did you get this dhikr from? The Imam says, In my dream, I saw Khidr reciting this dhikr. That even on the day of Safin, as Amir al Mu'mineen was next to Ammar bin Yasir, he would recite, Ya huwa, Ya man la huwa, illa huwa. Then you say, Qul huwa Allahu ahad. You say ahad, you don't say wahid. You know the Quran says Allahu al-wahid al-qahar. That what is the difference between wahid and ahad? When you want to understand this difference, you find there is a reality which Shaykh al-Saduq, he narrates in Kitab al-Tawheed. It's stated upon the day of Jamal. A man, he comes towards Amir al muminin He says, Ya Ali, can you explain to me what it means for Allah to be one? At that point, everyone, they jump at the throat of this man. They say, do you not see the heart of Amir al muminin is divided, meaning Ali is busy at this moment? That what time is this? To ask a question, is Allah one? We are in the middle of the battlefield. You find the Imam. He says a line that when you want to understand the world view of Ali ibn Abi Talib, you look at this line. The Imam, he would say, that let him ask this question, for what he is asking is what we want from the people. The Imam goes to show that every battle, whether it was Jamal, Safin, Nahrawan, it was to establish the true ma'rifat of Allah, which cannot be acquired except by understanding the reality of the Imam. Then after that, the Imam, he gives one of the most fascinating discourses on the unity of God. He says, oh man, when you say Allah is one, there are two aspects of this which are appropriate. There are two aspects of this which are not appropriate. He says, as for that which is not true for Allah, is that when you say he is one, you mean that he is numerically one. The Imam, he says, Man la tani lahu lam yadkhul fi bab al The one who has no second cannot be numerically counted. Then he says, when you say Allah is one, and if you mean he is one of a species, he is one of a no, you find this is not appropriate. Then he says, Ya Ali, what do we mean when we say Allah is one? The Imam, he says, when you say Allah is one, what you mean is that not a second cannot be like Allah. That a second cannot be conceived of like Allah. When you say Allah is one, it is not a numerical one. It is an existential one. Then Amir al muminin he says, the second reality which is appropriate, and this is the true meaning of the word ahad, is that Allah cannot be divided in existence or by the intellect or in any other manner. This is that reality. You find Amir al muminin he gives one of the most fast fascinating discourses on the unity of God in the middle of that battlefield. Then after that, you say, Allahu Samad. You know, Raghib al-Isfahani, he has a famous lexicon about the Quran called Mufradat. He examines the words within the Quran. He says the root of this word Samad is something, is that Lord which everyone, they refer towards him. 
that samad is something which is not hollow, something which is solid. The reality of this word samad is that everyone depends upon Allah, but Allah does not depend on anyone. Then you say, lam yalid wa lam yulad. That neither does he beget nor is he begotten and none is like him. You know, when you look at this chapter, you find this was one of the shortest chapters of the Quran. But it explained the reality of Tawheed. It explained the reality of Ali ibn Abi Talib, Al-Insan Al-Kamil. But you find the beauty of the Quran is that Allah, He created a balance between Amir Al-Mu'mineen and Fatimah Al-Zahra. That if there is one chapter within the Quran, which in terms of length, it may not look long, but it contains the realities of Ali. You find there is a similar chapter for Zahra when Allah says, Inna a'tayna kal kawtar. That Allah, He creates this balance between Zahra and Amir al Mu'mineen. You know, when you look within the Quran, right, so you find that there is one day which is specifically makhsus towards Amir al Mu'mineen, which is mentioned within the Quran. That day is Al Yawma Akmaltu Lakum Deenakum. That is that day in which we have completed this religion. You find if that day is mansub with Ali ibn Abi Talib, you find that there is one specific night within this Qur Quran, this one night upon this earth, and that is that night which says, Inna anzalnahu fi laylatil qadr, that we revealed it upon the night of Qadr. Our sixth Imam would say that this Qadr is none other than our grandmother Fatima. Zahra, that if the day is mansub with Ali, the night within the Quran is mansub with Zahra. You know, the day it represents something else, the night it represents something else. The day it represents katrat and multiplicity. The night it represents wahdat and unity. You know, even when you look in your life within the daytime, how busy are you in the daytime? You have many activities, you tend to your family, you tend to your businesses, to your school. But you find nighttime is that time of unison. That's why the Quran said towards Rasulullah that if you want to reach Maqam al Mahmud, that praiseworthy station, wake up in the night and recite Salatul Layl. You find that if the night represents unity, and that day is associated with imamat al yawma akmaltu lakum dinakum. That's why you find the reality is this, that there is one Zahra, 12 Imams revolve around the axis of Zahra. That doesn't the 11th Imam say, doesn't he say, Nahanu hujajullah ala khalke. That we are the proofs of Allah upon his creation, but our grandmother Zahra is the proof over us Ahlul Bayt. And you find this is that reality. But you find despite this reality of being the embodiments of the Qur'an, being the walking Qur'an, you find in the way the Ummah, it neglected the true status of the Qur'an, it neglected the true status of Ahlul Bayt alayhum salam. You know, tomorrow I'll recite that musibah. I'll recite three journeys over these next three nights. Tonight will be that journey of Ahlul Bayt from Karbala towards Kufa. Tomorrow from Kufa to Sham, and then after that from Sham towards Karbala. That what was this journey of Ahlul Bayt from Karbala towards Kufa? You know, Sayyidah Zainab, she made one request towards Shimar. She said, O oh Shimar, do not take these women in between the bodies. But you know, what does Shimar do? He takes them all in between the bodies. In the way a tasbih, when it breaks, and the beads they scatter, you find the women, they would scatter to the bodies of their beloved. That Umm Kulthum would go towards the body of Abbas. That Layla would go towards the body of Akbar. Farwa would go towards the body of Qasim. But you find the rivayat, they state there were two women who only stayed at the body of Hussein. The first was Rabab. The Rabab, she goes towards the body of Sayyid al-Shuhada. She says, oh my master, if my arms weren't tied, I would use my arms to cover your body from the sun. But oh my master, as long as 
as Rabab is alive. Rabab won't drink any cold water. Rabab won't go in the shade. You know, the second is Sayyid Zainab. You know, when Sayyid Zainab, she sees the wounded body of Sayyid Shohada. She says one line which is enough for Musiba. She looks at the body of her brother and she says, Anta al-Akhi, that are you my brother Hussein? Then she says, Ya Rasulullah, had al Hussein al muramalu biddama. She says, Oh Rasulullah, this is your Hussein who is covered in blood. After that, Sayyid Zanab, she begins to recite lines of ziyara. You know what she says at the body of her brother? She says, Assalamu ala al Hussein al Madloom, al Maktool, al Majruh al Adshana, al Madbu min al Kafa, fi yawm Ashura, bila jurm wala khata, al ladhi ghuslu damu wa kafanu rimal al Karbala. You know what she says? She says, Salam be upon my brother Hussein, my oppressed brother Hussein, the one who was killed thirsty. Then she says this line, she says, Al Madbu min al Kafa, that when they cut the neck of my brother, they didn't cut it from the front. From the back, they cut the neck of my brother Hussein, the one whose ghusl was done with the blood from his wounds, the one whose kafan was the khak of Karbala. That after that, Sayyidah Zainab, she says, Oh my brother, I promise my mother Fatima that when I bid farewell towards you, I would kiss your body, my brother. But your body is covered in wounds. There is not a spot that remains. You find this caravan. It begins to go towards Kufa. As it's going towards Kufa, it stated, Sayyid Sajjad Imam Zainul Abideen. He walks by the body of Sayyid Shohada. As he's walking by the body of his father, it stated the color of the face of the Imam. It begins to change. Sayyid Zainab, she looks at Imam Zainul Abideen. She falls off the back of the camel. The Imam, he says, oh my aunt, why did you do this? Sayyid Zainab, she says, oh my nephew, I lost everyone. As I was looking at you, I thought I was about to lose you as well. Why did the color of your face change? The Imam, he says, oh my aunt, what is a son supposed to do? As he sees the wounded body. You find this caravan, it begins to go towards Kufa. All of the necks of the women were upon one rope. Their arms were tied behind their neck. You know, it stated on the way towards Kufa, a point it came that Khuli, as he was carrying the head of Sayyid al-Shuhada, he drops the head of the Imam upon the ground. When he tries to pick the head of the Imam, the head of the Imam, it doesn't raise off the ground. Khuli, he goes towards Imam Zain al-Abideen. He says, O oh, Ali ibn al Hussein, why is the head of your father not lifting? The Imam, he says, Oh my aunt Zainab, go and find out the reason. When Sayyid Zainab, she looks, she finds that Sakina is missing. As she looks for Sakina, she sees that Sakina is in the lap of a lady dressed in black. She takes Sakina from that lady. She begins to thank that lady. That lady, she says, Oh Zainab, do you not recognize your mother Fatima, Oh Zainab? Oh Zainab, you didn't leave Medina alone. You find that moment it comes. Sayyid Zainab, she she begins to enter Kufa. You know, there was an alim, Mirzai Buzurg. In front of him, there was a reciter who was reciting Musiba. As he was reciting Musiba, he said, Dakhalat Zainab al ibn Ziyad. That Zainab has entered the court of Ibn Ziyad. Mirzai Buzurg said, Oh man, stop the Musiba. I can't handle anymore. They say, Oh Mirzai Buzurg, why are you saying this? He says, Zainab, the daughter of Ali. Ali is in the court of a drunkard. That what was the pain of Ali at this moment? You know, it's stated. When Amir al muminin he moved his Khilafat, his central point from Medina towards Kufa, his daughters didn't initially join him. 
He said, O Hassan, that bring my daughters at night time. When they came towards Kufa, a call was made, O people of Kufa, the daughters of Ali are coming, go within your home. It stated that the Imam on the outskirts of Kufa, he takes the rain towards the camel of Sayyidah Zainab. Sayyidah Zainab, she would be inside a curtain within that camel. When they come towards the door of Kufa, the Imam, he opens the curtain. He says, O oh, Zainab, this is the door of Kufa. They walk further. The Imam, he says, O oh, Zainab, these are the alleyways of Kufa. The Imam, he walks farther. He opens the curtain. He says, O oh, Zainab, this is the bazaar and the marketplace of Kufa. Then after that, he says, O oh, Zainab, this is the darbar and the courtyard of Kufa. At that point, Sayyidah Zainab, she says, O oh, my father, it would make sense if you told Abbas, if you told Muhammad al Hanafiya. But, oh my father, I'm going to stay within the home. The Imam says, O oh, Zainab, a time will come that you'll enter this Kufa, O oh, Zainab. O oh, Zainab, your arms will be tied. O oh, Zainab, your hijab won't be there. You know, a people, they would come towards this Ahlul Bayt in Kufa. They would try to give sadaqa towards Ahlul Bayt. Sayyidah Zainab would say, as sadaqatu alayn al-haram. That sadaqa, it is not permissible for us, Ahlul Bayt. You find a point it comes where a lady she goes towards Sakina the daughter of the Imam she gives her water Sayyidah Zainab she says oh lady we don't take sadaqa then the lady she says can this girl pray for us the three and a half year old daughter of the Imam she raises her hands the lady she says pray that in the way you are yatim pray that my children don't become yatim then she says in the way you are Asir, pray that my children don't become Asir. Then she says, pray that we get to go towards Medina. Sayyidah Zainab says, oh lady, who do you know in Medina? She says, I know the house of Ali and Fatima. She says, who do you know in the house of Ali and Fatima? She says, I know Zainab, I know Hussain, I know Abbas. Sayyidah Zainab says, oh Um Habiba, that is the head of Hussain, that is the head of Abbas. Oh, oh Mabiba, I am Zainab. Then what did Karbala do? To <laughs> ya Allah, we ask through the right of Muhammad and Ali Muhammad that wherever the followers of Ahlul Bayt are in difficulty, give help towards them. Ya Allah, wherever they are sick and ailing, cure them. Wherever they have any hajat or request in their hearts which are good for them, granted towards them. And Ya Allah, we pray for the hastening of the reappearance of the master of our time, Matameh Hussain.